Linkers, um, which is a continuation of the lecture that we had last week on neural encoding. So just to recap a little about what we did last lecture. Um, last lecture we were basically trying to start off uh, the goal of doing neural encoding by um, basically um, parameterizing the neural response of some neuron with respect to time. Right? We we're trying to see um, as time goes on, um, can we sort of um, create a model that inputs time and outputs some neural response? Um, we discussed several things to several like different ways to do this um, to capture this information. One of them was like um, the first one that we discussed was spike count rate. Um, the second one was firing rate, and the third one was average firing rate. And these all sort of capture um, information about um, neural response with respect to time. So we're going to continue this, except instead of doing neural response with respect to time, we want to map neural response with respect to some stimulus. Stimulus being like some external factor that the neuron is uh, responding uh, to. And this is where we get tuning curves. So, as I mentioned before, previously we're modeling neural response as a function of time, but we want to get closer to the ultimate goal of neural encoding, which is modeling neural response with respect to uh, given some stimulus. Right? This um, line here means the probability of some response given some stimulus. So we want to be able to predict what uh, a response will be given some external um, stimuli. And so we're essentially moving from, from this sort of model where we have a neural neuro response um, uh, as a function of time and we're moving to neural response um, with respect to some stimulus. And so the curves, basically in this lecture we're going to focus on a variety of different mathematical models that fit a lot of data that comes from real-world experiments. Um, the, the three uh, curves are going to be the Gaussian distribution, um, the cosine curve, and the sigmoid function. And we're basically going to explain the parameters different ex uh, of these models, uh, explain experiments, um, and different types of neurons that exhibit these sort of tuning curves when we record their data. And so you can get a better idea of how um, researchers do this sort of modeling with respect to the stimulus. So before we get into the first tuning curve that we're going to discuss, which is the Gaussian, um, the Gaussian tuning curve, um, first I want to discuss the Hubel and Weasel experiment, which is sort of a seminal experiment in the field of computational neuroscience. Um, it was done a while back, but basically what they did was they insert a, inserted an electrode into an, uh, uh, a cat's brain that specifically in the V1 um, area of the visual cortex of the cat. And basically, this uh, electrode would record electrical signals. Um, basically, uh, it would it would be able to record any sort of um, action potential that occurred, any any spike. And so they were trying to um, basically figure out what type of stimulus, what sort of visual stimulus um, caused this, uh, you know, a specific neuron in the electrode to start firing. That was their goal. And so they, they basically showed a stimulus on this screen here. And then if you move the, a certain bar of light um, in a certain direction or pattern, then the neural response would increase from this specific neuron that they were recording from. Um, and so this basically, they, they didn't just do it for one neuron. They actually... Um, sort of inserted this electrode in various parts of the cat's brain and then they got like different results and they found out that you know some neurons are very simple they they detect only a specific type of feature like a certain edge in a certain direction or something like that whereas other neurons um, can detect much more general features so they there's some neurons that can that fire when there's any sort of motion across the receptive field Right, whereas others just detect like edges in a specific shape, and so that kind of um, made clear to to scientists that there's some sort of hierarchical um, like computation occurring in the brain, where some neurons are responsible for 
um, representing very low level features in, in the individual field, whereas other neurons can represent more abstract things um, that also take into account like time. For example, one of these would be motion, right? If you have a neuron that's, um, that's firing when any motion is seen, then that has to aggregate a lot of information from lower level cells. And so basically their work um, shed light on the hierarchical system that's present within the visual cortex. And it's, it's a seminal experiment that a lot of other experiments have built upon. And so because of that, um, they won the Nobel Prize um, in medicine. Um, and so it's, pr it's a pretty big deal. But getting to the Gaussian tuning curve, basically, um, we, it turns out that you can actually use the Gaussian tuning curve to uh, model how a certain neuron, a specific um, neuron in, in the V1 cortex of, um, of a mammalian brain, um, responds. Like, what's the neural response given a bar of light in a certain orientation? So this is obviously, this is like a very sort of low level neuron right it's only responding so if you turn this this black bar here is a bar of light that would be moved across the screen right and so if you look at the these sort of horizontal lines on the right of these bars what they represent are the action potentials so there was a lot of neural response here right um, and a lot more here but it sort of dies down as the bar of light shifts from this orientation to other orientations, right? Um, so this is, it looks like this is sort of the optimal angle um, in which to orient the bar of light uh, because there's, you know, um, a high neural response here. And so it turns out that one of the best tuning curves for this specific example, which is sort of like um, the same... Uh, thing that was tested in the Hubel and Weasel experiment is the Gaussian tuning curve. Um, this is uh, spelled out as like, like this, but another name for this curve um, or a similar shape is the normal distribution, which you all learned in research stats. Um, um, this is basically a formalized, like this is how you represent that sort of curve um, mathematically. You know, this was not discussed in research stats, um, it's discussed in like probability theory, um, the actual like math behind this function. But um, in the next slide, we'll see the more general version of this. But just explaining the individual components to get this sort of shape that like unimodal shape. Um, our max here is the highest firing rate that can be attained. Usually um, the firing rate is expressed in hertz. Hertz is just um, a unit where it's like... Um, one over seconds, right? So um, you could think about this as like um, action potentials per second, right? Um, and so that's our max. It's basically the maximum high, uh, maximum um, firing rate that can be attained. Um, S is your input to the function. So here it's the angle in degrees of your um, of your bar of light here. Um, where this is zero, and then the other the deviations from that are either positive or negative, depending on you know how the 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 direction in which you're turning the bar of light. Um, S max is basically the attribute, the stimulus value that results in the highest, um, in in the highest firing rate, right? So here they basically set this angle. Uh, that I'm outlining with my mouse to zero, and then deviation from that uh, negative or positive depending on the direction. So here S max would be zero, but you can sort of center it however you like depending on how you're um, quantifying your stimulus. And then S max is, oh, sorry, we already discussed S max. Um, uh, this value is basically the standard deviation, you know, sigma f, is a standard deviation that controls the width of the tuning curve. Um, uh, and yeah, that's basically it. And so this is a sort of general version of the, the Gaussian curve that you'll see in, in your math classes. Um, uh, basically, in math, a uh, really nice property of the sort of Gaussian distributions is that if you take the integral um, of them or the area underneath the curve um, that area equals one 
right? Um, that's like a, a really useful property, except in this, in for the purposes of computational neuroscience, we don't really care um, about the area being one. We just want this like overall shape where we have some sort of optimal value for our stimulus to achieve the highest firing rate. And so for that purpose, um, we basically replace this sort of coefficient with our max, which is just our um, maximum uh, sort of firing rate that can be achieved. Here it's like about 50. Um, and everything else is very similar. Um, EXP, uh, sorry, I, I didn't mention this on the other slide, but EXP is just um, E to the power of, right? So you can imagine like putting E to the power of and everything else is pretty much the like exact same as what you see here, where X is S, uh, mu is S max, right? That's like the center of the distribution. And then sigma is sigma F, um, where, um, that's that controls the width, you know, the standard deviation. And so that's basically it. So the other another tuning curve that we're going to be discussing is the cosine tuning curve. And so before we get into that, I just want to explain the experiment from which the data was collected um, that we're going to be talking about. So in this experiment, it's not as popular as the Hubel and Weasel experiment, um, but Basically, a monkey was sort of trained to reach out in certain areas, um, in certain directions, right? And given the angle in which the monkey reached out, we can see different sort of neural responses. Um, interestingly, you know, this is not really a stimulus per se. You know, we're talking about the researchers who conducted this experiment specifically training the monkey to reach out into certain directions. So... Really, it's sort of a goal of the monkey to reach out in a certain degree. It's not really an external stimulus, but regardless, we can actually still use the degree measure to par parametrize um, the neural response. So that's basically what we're going to be doing. Um, it turns out that this specific neuron that the data was recorded from responds better when the monkey is reaching out towards its left, you know, um, between angles 90 and 180. Um, that can be seen... Uh, in sort of like the density of the black lines here. Yeah. As before, the black lines represent action potentials, and um, basically the researchers took five trials um, of, of... They did five trials of this experiment. Um, so each of these rows of bars represents one trial. And so you can see, like, there was a lot of um, firing... Uh, there was a high firing rate here and here and here. But as we move towards the right, um, the, the action potentials become uh, sparser in, you know, there's not that many. And so that shows that this specific neuron is sort of optimized, um, is, is firing when the monkey is reaching out towards its left. And so a tuning curve that is widely used when there's any sort of periodic behavior with respect to a stimulus um, is the cosine tuning curve. Um, note that the cosine tuning curve can also be used in places where the Gaussian tuning curve is used. You know, it does achieve a similar shape um, when when you're in a certain window, right? I mean, um, even though it's periodic, if you zoom into a specific part, it'll look uh, fairly similar to a cosine function, I mean, a Gaussian distribution. So you kind of have to choose based on the scenario. But, I mean, this is sort of very similar to what you would see in math class. Um, here, there's a vertical shift in the cosine function. So R0 is the y-intercept that we see here. And that's just the value um, that, that's just the value of the firing rate when the stimulus is 0. Well, you know, um, and then R max is the maximum firing rate that can be achieved by like sort of the optimal stimulus uh, here it's about like 50 um, and then s max is the stimulus value that causes the the firing rate to get up that high right and so you can kind of tell like if you plug in s max here this goes to zero right because s max minus s max is zero and then cosine is one i mean cosine of zero is one and so you know that results in the that results in R max as being your firing rate. And so this is uh, 
pretty useful. One small thing to note is that sometimes, given how we define the function, sometimes you can get um, the curve to output negative values for certain stimulus. Um, in the previous graph, that wasn't the case, given the um, values that we used. But if that is the case, you know, obviously you can't have a negative um, firing rate. Like, it doesn't make sense to say, okay, my neuron fired negative, um, you know, 60 times in a second or something like that. So uh, there, you can just cap it at zero. So just say if... Um, Sorry, um, if we are, basically, if the output of this is greater than zero, um, leave it as is, but if it's less than zero, then um, just make it zero. And so that's sort of um, a quick way to fix that issue. And so now we're going to be talking about our last tuning curve, which is the sigmoidal tuning curve. But before we do that, I just wanted to discuss retinal disparity, which is... Um, the sort of interesting application that we'll be applying the sigmoidal tuning curve to. Um, so retinal disparity is basically the idea that your eyes see different things. Um, if you close one eye and open the other and then switch, you know, the world looks a little different and that's because your eyes are located on different parts of your head. And so this diagram sort of illustrates that where usually there's a fixation point where the, the lines of sight of both of your eyes will meet, they'll intersect. Right? This is the natural line of sight for your left eye, this is the natural line of sight of your right eye, and they both intersect at the fixation point. So if an object is closer to your eyes than the fixation point, um, we define the disparity angle, uh, this angle here, to be negative. Um, and if the object that you're looking at is farther away than the fixation point, we define this angle to be positive. Um, and so this graph is actually a graph from a neuron in the V1 cortex of the brain where positive angles, you know, represent, um, you know, faraway objects as we discussed and negative angles represent closer objects. And so you can see that the neuron from, um, from which this data was recorded is a far tuned cell. You know, this only fires um, when when we have a far away object. It does not fire at all when um, there's a closed object. And so to model um, any neural responses that look like this shape, we use something called the sigmoidal tuning curve. Uh, this curve is defined here. Um, if you've um, you know, taken, I think, um, like math four or five at TJ, or um, have done like machine learning or stuff, you may recognize this um, as a sigmoid function. Um, here, exp just means e to the e raised to the power of um, whatever's in these parentheses, um, and so just explaining the parameters, r max is the maximum value that can be attained here. Um, s s one half here is um, the stimulus val the the value of the stimulus that um, results in the halfway point of this sort of spike here. Right, so here it would be about, um, I think, like maybe 18 or so. Um, and then delta S um, controls how fast this spike occurs. You can imagine that, I mean, this is almost like a step function. It's a bit dramatic. But you could imagine that the curve looks a little bit more like this. Um, sort of more like a population growth curve where it's like a gradual growth. Um, and so delta S controls... Um, how fast this sort of jump occurs and you can also flip it and so if delta s is negative the graph will look like a reversed s um, instead of this shape and so that's basically the sigmoidal tuning curve and that's the last curve that we have um, these three curves are like the mainly used curves in that that are able to model most neuron neuron behavior there there are other ones too um, but these are the main ones that you should know and so that, that's it. Um, uh, and thank you for thank you for watching.